Turn with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 1. And uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we'll begin reading in verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We have thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ and the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. And I want you to carefully notice verse number 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only. Notice here, he calls it our gospel. It came not unto you in word only. Now it's important that the gospel be preached in word. That is that the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ be uh, declared continually from the pulpit, from the teachers, and from God's children who witness. But also notice that there's something else that it comes with. But also... In power. Power is when the Spirit of God overcomes uh, our weaknesses and our frailties, and the power of God uh, shines forth upon the gospel and makes it effectual. The day that we were saved, the gospel became effectual. That is, it did something, it was more than just passing words. It did more than just go in one ear and out the other. It went to the heart. And when the gospel goes to the heart, it changes your life. Notice he says, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance. You see, when we doubt our faith, we don't know that we're saved, uh, then our life is not going to be filled with the power of God the way it should. I can't tell you how many times that I witness to people and I'll ask them, uh, well, are you saved? And they'll say, yeah, I'm saved. And then a little later on I'll say, now if you were to die today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? And you know what they usually say? I hope I will. Uh, I, I don't know. And then I say to them, if you don't know, then how in the world do you think you're going to get to heaven if you don't know? The Bible says, These things have I written unto you that ye may know that you have eternal life. That is something that the child of God should know in their heart and have assurance. Paul says, it, The Holy Ghost came upon the gospel with power and in much assurance. I know today that if I drop dead where I stand, I know where I'm going. I don't have any doubts about it. He goes on, he says, You know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. That is, they were servants. They preached in love. They helped them. And you became followers of us. And of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Because remember, they were under constant persecution. So that you were in samples or examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. And that word sounded uh, comes from the root word echo. You know, like you, you uh, scream out in a valley or a canyon and you hear the word, your words as they echo back and forth through the valley. The same is true as we preach the gospel because it reflects off of you and it reflects off of someone else 
and it continues to bounce and to go here and there and uh, everywhere as we preach the gospel. And he says, But also in every place your faith to, to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned from to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's what every one of us did when we got saved. Because before we were saved, uh, we followed our flesh, we followed after whatever philosophy of the world. But when Christ came into your heart and you were born from above, you had a new life and you turned from your idols I was an idolater of the highest sort I worshipped things in my life that I thought were so vitally important until the day that God changed my life and showed me that those things should not be first in my life but Christ he goes on and says, Last of all, to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Christ is alive. He was buried, and He arose from the grave, and He ascended to the Father, and He's coming again. Now, for time's sake, I want us to concentrate this morning upon verse 5 in particular. And I want us to notice a few things about this important text. Remember that this epistle was addressed by Paul to very young Christians at Thessalonica. They had been converted only as much as maybe a year or so. Some of them were even just Christians for months. And in the first letter that he wrote that has been included in the canon of Scripture was this study concentrating upon the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're told seven things about preaching the gospel that every one of us ought to know. The first thing that we note carefully is for our gospel. Here is bold words by the Apostle Paul. He doesn't speak of the gospel but of our gospel. The gospel is the message of grace in which God spells out His love to mankind. And it is described in the New Testament. In Romans 1, if you'll turn there with me for a moment, Romans uh, chapter 1 and verse 15, uh, we learn about the power of the gospel uh, to change our life. Chapter 1, verse 15. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Not to everyone that gets baptized, or not to everyone who is a church member, but to everyone that believeth. Amen. The Greek word pistis, and it means just like I'm leaning on this pulpit, and just like you're sitting in a pew, just like we get in our car and turn the key, we rely upon it, we trust in it, and we believe in it, but the gospel is the, the believing to the saving of your soul, which is a supernatural work of God's grace. And as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul was not ashamed of this gospel, for it was the power of God to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. We see that the apostle spells out uh, God's love to mankind and describes it throughout the New Testament. In Romans 1.15, it's the gospel of God because God is the author of it. Man did not invent the gospel. It was given to us by God. 
Only the mind of God could come forth with such a glorious plan and purpose to save sinners. It's also uh, seen in 2 Corinthians as the glorious gospel of Christ. And uh, we see it in Ephesians 1.13 as the gospel of your salvation. Because the gospel conveys the good news of salvation to every sinner who believes. In Ephesians 6.15, as the gospel of peace, aren't you thankful that God brought peace to your heart when He saved you? The, the war and the enmity that was between us and God was taken away. And now we have full access into the very presence of our Heavenly Father because of the work of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We see also that in Romans 2, Paul actually describes the gospel as my gospel. It was Paul's, but not exclusively. It was not only Paul's, but it's ours too. It's my gospel, and it's your gospel. It is our first uh, because we're entrusted with it. If, if you uh, remember in Romans 1.16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. One of the biggest challenges that we have in our Christian life is being ashamed of the gospel. We know what it's done for us. We know what it's done for others. But somehow the flesh is so weak that when we start telling what the gospel can do, we clam up and the devil tries to shut our mouths. We get out with people and we think, well, what will they say if I talk to them about the gospel or if I talk about Christ and what He's done for me? Has the gospel come to you. Paul said in Acts chapter 16 and Acts 25 through 34 that the gospel had come to these individuals. Oh, thank God for the day that the gospel came to me. The gospel of grace. I was going along through life lost and undone, no hope going from this idea to that idea, tossed to and fro. I had no direction. I had no purpose. I was an 18-year-old boy living in darkness. And then the gospel of grace came. And when the gospel of grace came, God forever brought light to my soul. And how I praise Him for that. As long as I live for what He's done for me and what He's done for you and the things He's going to continue to do in our lives. Times may get hard. Times may be difficult. But the gospel of grace has that power. Paul says in verse 5, by whom we have... <clears throat> excuse me. He says in verse 5, for our gospel came not unto you in word only. It came unto you in power. There in Acts 16, we have the jailer who was watching the Apostle Paul and um, trying to keep him in jail. And at midnight, the jail began to shake. And Paul and Silas came out. And... Um, they preached the gospel to the jailer, and he got saved. But not only did he get saved, his family got saved. And at midnight, they took Paul and Barnabas, and they uh, washed their, their wounds. And they loved them, and they, they nourished them and helped them because they had received the gospel of grace. The man who brought me the gospel of grace was named Sid Bishop. And Brother Sid Bishop left Ohio and retired 
came to the mountains of eastern Kentucky to Levi Baptist Church. And there on a Sunday morning, I went, and for the first time in my life, I heard a man preach the gospel with spiritual ears. And I heard not just the death, but I heard about the burial, and I heard about the resurrection, and I heard that in Christ all my sins would be put away, and I would have everlasting life, and I would be a new creature in Christ. And God wrought a blessing to my soul that I'll never forget. And uh, I, I rejoice and thank God for the faithfulness of Brother Bishop. You feel the same way about people who brought you the gospel. Uh, maybe it wasn't just one person. Maybe it was your parents, or maybe it was your, your brother or your sister, or a friend or someone that loved you, and they gave you the gospel. But it was communicated to you in word, and it spread. This method that God has chosen to bring the gospel by word of mouth. This is how God first sent the gospel to a, a very significant and wonderful way. Remember, he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he met Peter and Andrew, and he said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And he called out his disciples, and they gladly left their nets and Whatever they were doing, he called different ones that were tax collectors and some that were uh, not really so much uh, accepted by the community, but he called them and they preached the gospel in word and in power. We see in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, uh, Go ye therefore into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel baptize those who believe and then teach them to observe all things and lo I'm with you always even to the end of the age that's what the work of the gospel is about not just to simply tell them the gospel but to help them find scriptural baptism and to find a church where the Bible is preached and Christ is declared openly Paul says that the gospel came to us in verse 5, came in word, but it also came in power. Now you can't substitute for this. You see, nobody can just produce the power of God. The Lord has to be on you. His Spirit has to be in you. There has to be a fire burning in your soul and in your heart, and only God can do that. When the gospel comes to you in power, it causes you to shake spiritually and maybe even physically. Quite literally, Paul is saying that this gospel has inherent power. That is, we preach it, whether to a crowd or an individual, and the gospel has power in it. We see again in Romans 1.16, uh, where he, he calls it the incorruptible seed. And also 1 Peter 1.23, the Word of God is incorruptible. And when we preach the Word and share the Word, whether it, it's in written form or orally speaking, uh, whatever it may be in, the gospel has power. Remember Zechariah pointed out in chapter 4 and verse 6, that the Word of God would come and it would not be by might or by power, talking about the work of man, but by the Spirit. That's why we depend upon the Spirit of God to bring conversion to the lost. One man said, if you can talk somebody into something, somebody else can talk them out of it. And so if all we try to do is get people to walk down the aisle and get them to repeat a prayer and say a few words and then tell them they're saved, then we've missed completely what God is doing in His work of grace. There must be a drawing. There must be a wooing. 
And if we try to force the gospel upon someone's heart without the power of God, it will not penetrate into the heart. Remember the Lord told the disciples, and and in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, they repeated what He said. But He said, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me. And he goes on to explain that they would witness in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the world. They would start at home, and wherever they went, they would declare the wonderful gospel of Christ. It also came in much assurance. What does it mean? Paul is saying that when he preached, he preached with authority. And this is under the blessing of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you here today that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's not being a member of a church that saves you. Even though I believe the Lord has started His kind of church, and and I believe His kind of church is here upon this earth and will continue. But there are many who teach you that by joining the church... That is a part of your salvation. And then they want you to observe the Lord's Supper or take the Mass, as the Catholics call it, in order to get grace brought to you. But that won't do it. There is nothing in the Bible that teaches that. The Bible teaches that the power is in the Gospel. There's a desperate need for this kind of preaching today in our world preachers that will preach the gospel without fear without favor several things that are needed first the people press to hear the word when it's preached I wonder today how much we enjoy the preaching of the word there is uh, no room in our life to have complacency Because the time is short. We don't know how many days that we shall live. Today, tomorrow, the next day, sooner or later, we're all going to pass from this life. It is appointed unto man once to die after this the judgment. And even if you live to be my age, 60, soon I'll be 60. If you live to be 60, I'll tell you this, it passes as if it were just a a blink of an eye. It's gone. And if you live to be like some of our other saints who maybe are 70 or 80, they'll tell you the same thing. It passes in a blink of an eye. And what we do for Christ is the only thing that will last. It doesn't matter how much you obtain in this life. I've seen men and known men who attain great financial success and had them tell me from their hearts, yes, it's good to have money and it's good to be able to provide and bless others, but money will not satisfy the cravings and the longings of God's call in your heart. Because only by drawing nigh to Him and walking with Him and serving Him will you feel His presence and His power in your life. Paul concluded in verse 5 in saying, You know what manner of men we were among you for your sake something about a saved person that we just can't explain. But when, you, uh, when you're in the workplace and you have a saved person that you meet or you start talking to and, and you, you experience that, that camaraderie and that, that trust and faith, I mean, it's a blessing. Amen. Just to know people who, who know the Lord, uh, what a thrill it is to... to see the love they show and the the attitude that they have. 
And the Apostle Paul refers to this when he says, you know the kind of men we were. You know the life we lived. You know what was most important in our lives because you knew us. You walked with us. You, you were there in worship with us. You, we were there together all through the communities and we talked about Christ and glorified Him. And folks, there are some people that are good liars. There are some people that will trick and deceive and do a good job of it. But I want to tell you something. Ultimately, you will not deceive God. And you may be slick with the tongue, but God knows your heart. And if your heart is not right with Him, then uh, all is lost. Paul says, we were, we were men among you. They weren't uh, anything to doubt about what they were, men. And they were men of God. This is the significance of what Paul is saying. The gospel came to the Thessalonians. The gospel came to us. Oh, how that thrills my soul that God didn't pass me by. That God could have just passed over us and left us to ourselves, but He didn't do that. If you had a Christian family who told you the gospel and raised you in the Lord, what a blessing. I didn't have that. My dad didn't know the Lord. My mom didn't know the Lord. They talked about Him, but in reality, they didn't know Him. The things that I saw and the things I had to experience as a little boy that I remember so vividly today because my parents were not godly people, I'll spend my lifetime trying to forget but to have someone close to you who loves you and gave you the gospel, raised you in the house of God, taught you how important the Lord is, you ought to thank God with all your heart for the examples of good people in your life. I want to share with you this poem that I came across, and it declares the gospel in such a real way. It's really a hymn. Send thou, O Lord, to every place swift messengers before thy face, the heralds of thy wondrous grace, where thou thyself wilt come. Send men whose eyes have seen the King, men whose ears have heard the sweet words ring, Send such thy lost loved ones home to bring. Send them where thou wilt come. A couple weeks ago, a man called me. And uh, we've been friends for about 30 years. He's never been to church. But I've talked to him about Christ many times. And uh, he said, Pastor, he said, my brother, I'm afraid he's dying. And he said, I, I was asking myself, who, who do I know that I could call and ask to go to my brother and talk to him about Christ and to make sure he's saved? And he said, Pastor, the only man I could think of was you. And he, with tears in his eyes, he said, Would you go see my brother who's dying? And even though I was really sick, I, I got up and I said, I'm going to go see this man. And I went into the hospital room and we began with uh, reading scripture and prayer. And then I asked him what his favorite hymn was. And we sung couple verses of the hymn 
And then I told him, I said, if I never see you again, will I see you in heaven? Do you know that you're saved? And he said, well, pastor, I'm, I'm not where I ought to be. He explained to me how he'd gotten away from God, wasn't, hadn't been going to church for years. And I turned in the Word of God and read to him about the gospel, how to be saved and how to know you're saved. And so I led him in prayer, and uh, I heard him praying as I was praying. And he asked Christ to come into his heart and give him assurance of his salvation. After we were finished, he, he told me how much he appreciated me telling him the gospel. And I thought, in, in so many people's lives, if they had somebody that could go and tell someone the gospel and they couldn't even think of anyone, what a dark world we would have. Fewer and fewer are those who preach the gospel. He told me that one preacher he called told him that he would go in and have communion with him. And he said, why would you have communion with him? He said, I'm, I'm wanting the man to be saved. And he said, well, if he has communion, he'll be saved. And he said, show me in the Bible where the Bible teaches that communion saves you. So he said, very few pastor know the truth. Today, if you're not saved, I point you to Christ. Has He come to you in power today? Do you know that you're saved? If you don't, put your trust in Him. He'll never fail you. Let's all stand together. I'll ask if Brother Philip will come to lead us. I shine in